Done. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Foster, uh, in your submission, or shall I say more appropriately, the submission from your organisation, the Special Interest Group of Municipal Authorities, um, it was noted the uh, about you know, the knock-on effect uh, to councils of welfare reform, uh, or, uh, or better, better put as welfare cuts. Now, I can see that happening within my own Slough constituency when constituents are coming to me in tears with respect to whether it's uh, homelessness or inability to find housing, adequate housing, uh, overcrowding issues and so on. But can you explain, um, you know, for the record, um, how exactly it actually puts pressure on councils? I think, and again, um, there's lots of anecdotal evidence around, as you've said, uh, councils from Arsigoma authorities raising the issues around people who are obviously within their housing system having sort of the various council tax support reductions, having the benefit freeze, having the caps on, on rents and um, pr uh, turning up at surgeries around issues to do with that. I think there's quite a lot of evidence around and we've outlined some of that in the, in the submission around the links to things such as increases in mental health, drug misuse, crime, uh, particularly knife crime and obviously homelessness as, as another thing. I think we, we included that in our submission because we wanted to try and reflect, you know, fair funding and, and council tax funding is around the citizen. And, you know, what we're seeing is as well as cuts in local government funding to provide some of those support services to the most vulnerable, we're cutting back those support services, preventative services, and the uh, sort of changes within the welfare reform are putting additional pressures on individuals. So they're presenting more for support that's no longer there. So it's a bit of a, a sort of a, a chicken and egg. Um, we've been trying to pull some evidence around that. There's, there's not an awful lot out there, particularly in terms of um, one area we're looking at in terms of movement of people who can't afford to live in sort of the communities they've lived in because they can't afford the rents and that's shifting people moving out of communities and you lose that community cohesion as well. So we were just trying to pull out that, that wider impact on the actual individuals of both local government austerity and general austerity elsewhere. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Lord Porter, there was an, an excellent article in the FT um, a couple of years ago about how people were moving over to towns with very low um, uh, housing prices. For example, uh, you know, they identified Blackpool uh, which um, you know, e even people who had um, you know, uh, lots of benefits that they were actually moving over uh, to Blackpool and which uh, it, because of the, the low house prices which in effect meant that Blackpool ended up be having the highest share of people who live on incapacity benefits um, and uh, you know, th and also it led to issues with regards to the number of looked after children uh, in Blackpool incre increasing exponentially. Now, uh, in your experience, uh, you know, do you think that changes in the local housing allowance have actually caused people to move uh, into more deprived area areas where housing is cheaper? Um, pretty difficult for me to get my head around that on, on behalf of the the uh, local government association, but. As an individual council leader, I, I get lots of people coming to my own council, South Holland, to retire. So I have a different type of problem. Yeah. So, so it's kind of you know, my county council has to look after more old, elderly people because they retire from elsewhere in the country because sell of house prices because they could sell a house for a decent sum of money in one area and move to another. So, a transitory population is something we've always had, I think, as in the country. But I, I haven't heard Simon, who runs Blackburn, particularly single out that people are moving in because of the benefits system that they're caught into. But it's probably worth noting that I think last year the government spent about 800 million quid on discretionary housing payments. Mm -hmm. We don't know how much we're going to be getting this year. So, so if nothing else, a little bit of certainty, if you could lobby for that, you might be adding a, a bit more into what we're dealing with. Um, okay. Oh, sorry, no, it's not last year, it's the last four years, three years, so 200 million quid a year. We don't know what we're getting this year, but I, I couldn't tell you in Blackpool's case, I don't know what happened to okay. Simon's people. Well, uh, Councillor Fuller, obviously in your capacity as the chair of the uh, uh, the district council's network, uh, perhaps you know, you've know you got, you've had experience talking to other 
um, you know, the district uh, leaders uh, in other parts of the country. Do you think that that, uh, that that has been the case? And what effect has this had on local services? Well, it's been somewhat difficult. Where, where the local housing allowance is significantly below average rent levels, it restricts the ability of people to go into private rented accommodation. And therefore, there's a greater pressure on uh, social housing. And if that can't be met for whatever reason, and we've got a very good record of delivering social housing in our authority area, but there's still not enough, then people will either go elsewhere to in turn lower areas and, uh, and or become homeless. And that obviously we try and prevent that as best we can. It, the complication comes when we're one of the areas which is just relatively late to universal credit uh, is rolled out in our area and it's that interplay between if you're on universal credit often there's council tax support involved and of course universal credit is run by DWP council tax support is run by uh, the local council so there's a doubling up so Francis referred to making the system around the individual straight away there's a duplication there and it is the case that different councils have different discretionary ways of addressing council tax support. And there are some quite complicated interplays between universal credit and council tax support, which give unintended consequences. We have the discretionary housing payments, that, which are there really as an emergency, but sometimes our DWP colleagues send them almost as a top up. And, and DHP, discretionary housing payment, isn't meant to be as a top-up. It's meant to be for exceptional circumstances to get people back on their feet in a sustainable situation. And so I totally, entirely endorse this, the point that uh, Lord Porter made there about the, the importance of um, uh, certainty around discretionary payments. The other point as well is that if, you are, if we are, have that aspiration to have the system around the individual, Actually, it would be much better for councils to operate a DWP system rather than send people to DWP offices. If they come to the council, not only can we use the universal, help them with the universal credit, actually go digital by default, we can address housing issues, debt issues, decent homes, overcrowding. So the, your local council is much better able to address the multiple causes of problems to try and solve problems. Where sometimes I wonder whether the DWP is just interested in managing a caseload. Much better for the council to solve the problem uh, and, and to get people back on their feet. And we've got more tools in our box than the DWP has. And I think better integration there and calling for better integration and co location is a much better outcome and, and would have a quite material improvement in people's lives. Okay. Uh, Councillor Carter, uh, uh, good to see you uh, see yourself again. And um, in your considerable experience as, as the chair of the um, County Council's network, uh, do you think that central government has done enough to actually understand, you know, fully understand the impact of benefit changes to local government? Well, the benefits is more the uh, remit of the district councils. But I mean, I mean, certainly my experience in Kent <coughs> is that the is a pull factor in many of the authorities around London where certainly permitted development rights on office buildings are seeing a significant number of London families, some of them quite challenging families, uh, where London boroughs are acquiring blocks, and that's uh, particularly uh, around some of the coastal quarters, but also in Maidstone, which is again an area where you know there's an office block being converted to 300 units at this moment in time, being acquired by a London borough to place uh, some uh, some of their families in very rapidly, and many of those families are, as I say, quite challenging families that will need uh, additional help and support, and the provision of school places and potentially EHCPs and all of that, which is putting a burden. If you look what has been going on, you probably know well as having been a county councillor up until very recently in Kent, uh, the uh, number of uh, challenging uh, families out of London placed into East Kent and Thanet, uh, particularly also looked after children where uh, there are a lot of uh, homes run by London boroughs for, uh, looked after, uh, for foster children in care. Uh, in those uh, uh, areas and so on. So that pull factor is still there. You could say it's, it's been going on for so many years. Has it changed much? I think it has changed for the, for the worst slightly, um, and we're monitoring that very closely. But the independent benefit, other than council tax benefit, uh, I, I can't really comment on from personal experience. Okay, thank you. There is an oh. factor there. To develop uh, Paul's point in the sense that, and I know new regulations on SIL have been laid today and I haven't had a chance to read them all, but in the conversion of offices, there's no Section 106, there's no SIL to pay for the infrastructure, for the education infrastructure, or in fact any other infrastructure that goes along with those pressures. So th th there's a dynamic effect there.